Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Tom Reale. He has a lot of identities, but more than anything else, he is a wordsmith, and for that I truly appreciate him. Tom's fascination with words began as a teenager when he landed an internship as a local government and business journalist for a small New England-based weekly newspaper. Nearly 30 years later, a B.A. in Italian language and literature from the University of Rhode Island and an M.B.A. in technology management from the University of Phoenix later, his journey in publishing continues with his post as President and COO at Brown Books Publishing Group, where he leads and embodies the author-owned and empowered entrepreneurial publishing model. He sat down with our friend and today co-host Gabby Jurgens to talk about authors, books, and the publishing business. And Tom's insight comes from those 30 years spent at a number of the top publishing houses, Harper Collins, Random House, Miller Freeman, Hufter Mifflin Harcourt, and all of the competencies he built up across a variety of roles from writer to program director to content manager. Now get this. In addition to traversing the various roles at these storied organizations, Tom also captured for posterity the transformation of his body from one of a sedentary office worker to a ready and capable athlete with healthy cholesterol numbers and an enviable physique. He is seemingly unstoppable at everything he does, and we appreciate him. We also urge you to help us out for two minutes by rating and reviewing The Break It Down Show, especially if you like us, on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to find podcasts like ours. Every positive review helps more listeners find out about us, and we always like to grow the tribe and bring you more shows like this. You should also check out Tom Reale's YouTube channel for fitness videos and motivational exercise demonstrations. You're really going to like him. He's a great guy, and you're going to like him on today's show. Here's our guest, Tom Reale. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Yoga. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Tom Reale. You're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Now, Tom is from Brown Books, and we got a chance to chat with him. You know, we have a lot of authors on, but we don't often have the folks on the publishing side. I'm interested in exploring this aspect of the business because everybody wants to write a book, but the reality is it's really hard to sell books. And when you want to understand how to do that, you go to the top, you go to the publishers, you go to folks that have been in the business for a long time. And this show is co-produced and co-hosted by my very good friend, Gabby Jurgens. And Gabby is here today with me, and we're going to talk. And she, I guess you should check out Gabby over at ahomefrontgirl.com. She's got fantastic products, and we all want to wear red on Fridays, and she supports that. So go check out Gabby's work as well. Gabby, thanks for coming on and co-hosting with me. Oh, absolutely. Great fun, and thanks for the shout-out. It's always fun to be here on the Break It Down Show. Welcome, Tom, to the Break It Down Show. I am thanks, excited. Baby. Oh, absolutely. I'm excited to where this is going to go because. I love words. I love books. And you're right. You go to the head of the of the class, and that's Tom, Chief Operating Officer and President of Brown Books Publishing. Tom, that's a big title, President and COO of Brown Books Publishing. You know, everybody has a book in them, right? I commonly say everybody's got a great idea. That's not uncommon. That's just everybody has one. The execution of that idea is another level up. But then repetition of executing great ideas You know, and that's how you build an audience. So someone who's trying to sort it out without breaking their heart, what is the reality in the publishing game? Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. You know, and that's how you build an audience. So someone who's trying to sort it out without breaking their heart, what is the reality in the publishing game? You know, to answer your question, Pete, 
in terms of what are people facing when they're considering being an author today. And interesting piece about that is it's it, every week, every month, it, it's changing. When I, I came into the business nearly 35 years ago, there was conversation about change in publishing, but everybody was really focused on, on technology at that time. And I always found that conversation, frankly, to be boring, even though I was hired by a lot of large publishers in the 90s to help sort out the introduction into publishing production, into publishing manufacturing, into publishing authoring tools, into editing tools. But I always had the sense that that was the, the blasé part of the conversation. And the more interesting conversation is the one that we're having now, which is the change in business model and the shift in how publishing acquires its audience how that's occurred over the last 20 years. So the good news for authors is that there have never been more ways to get into publishing a book than there are today. And the bad news for authors is that there have never been more ways <laughs> right. to get into publishing a book. Yeah. <laughs> and it can seem like it can seem like a sea of choices and confusing turns from, you know, self-publishing to traditional royalty publishing to what we do which is a hybrid, it's an author-owned model that has full infrastructure on the back. There are a lot of things to weigh in terms of cost structures, potential benefits, what your audience reach can potentially be, everything from just you know, throwing something on, up on Amazon all the way you know, down to uh, you know, getting a multi-book contract from a major publisher through uh, building your own audience and, and having better control through what we do. But no matter what you do, and I, and I have stressed this uh, as a speaker for writers groups around the country, you are facing a lot of work. Right. End of story. As an author, you are facing a lot of work. And what I tell people is that the work actually starts after the book's print. The writing, the craft, the artistry, if you're, if you're publishing fiction, the focus and research, if you're publishing nonfiction, not only does it have to be a passion for something that you want to put down in several tens of thousands of words at minimum, uh, if not more than 100,000 words, it is something that you then need to be prepared to go out and connect with a lot of people around in what might be a very success. And it will require a, just a tremendous amount of perseverance and patience, like anything else. There are over half a million books published in the United States every year, and getting people's attention on your title is difficult, unless you happen to be famous already, or unless you, you know, have some kind of position or, or you're running for political office, or if you are already a well-known and established author, then, then you've got an established following. But between now and then, if you have just craft and passion, be prepared to hunker down, get on the road, ask bookstores for signings, look for ways to market, look for organizations that can help you do that, and you know, figure out what it is that you're going to be able to do relative to budget, no matter what you're doing. Because if you go to a major publisher and they offer you a contract, and then you ask about marketing, often they'll turn around and say, great, what are you doing? I fell the push to a point, you know, especially early in the run of a book. But, you know, as you you know move into uh, later in the process, the large publishers are more interested in seeing which books are going to move and move fast. They're going to put a lot of focus on those titles. And then after that, you know, the authors are pretty much on their own if, if their book didn't catch early. In business models where authors are owning, either in the self model or the hybrid model, there's a lot more say into how long the author wants to push on a title or a series of titles and move and build their audience. So as you know, be running you know, this podcast to yourself, there is so much that is dependent on platform. And in platform, you're going to call and create an audience and you're going to drive. And really, it's, it's no different from what you're doing today. I want to go back and highlight what you said, because this is a thing I've realized fairly recently. I, I don't have your pedigree for a time in the industry, but you're 100% right. Like the, the 100,000 words that you put together that's, I don't want to undermine it. That's cute, you know, but the, you have to be salesman of the year every year in your organization. And if you don't think that writing books is a sales job, you are not only sadly mistaken, you're tragically mistaken. That's right. And that's where, you know, I have a, one of our, our excellent authors was just doing a piece on this online yesterday um, where she was talking about sacrifice, you know, and, and the sentiment that in order to become what you want to be, you have to give up what you are. And in, in doing that, you know, she's has made a lot of the Her name is Debbie Walls, and she's in a YA fantasy series right now. And regardless of who we're working with and, and how good they are, the ones that work apply themselves the hardest and are able to take advantage of, you know, the infrastructure that a publisher can provide, uh, they're the ones who will 
you know, eventually get ahead. They will the ones who, who will move forward. But in doing that, the creative process is just a piece of the overall issue and, and effort. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, you have to be someone who, you know, if you get into, let's say you get, you get a sign, you get a major bookstore. You want to be someone who not only executes that extremely well, but that where that bookstore manager will call other bookstore managers and say, you have to get this person in. You know, and because that's what leads to, you know, like in, in our case, bookstores then requesting and then conventions requesting and then large conventions requesting and eventually that audience build creates its own momentum. That's for you. Okay, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions and touch on some points that you mentioned. One of them being that as publisher and in today's publishing world, a writer doesn't exactly, doesn't just have the creative that they have to complete, you know, go through the book, get it done and get it ready for submission and send it to a publisher that you hope will like it. Marketing and being able to brand yourself and being able to speak publicly and doing that. You can't, you can no longer, I think, hide behind just the typewriter or let's just say the laptop any longer. I mean, I think you have to be front and center to, because you know your book the best and you want to help someone like you be able to put it out there and do the best that they can. Now, I actually read that entry by that person that was talking about the fantasy writer. I just can't remember her name, but she mentioned that, you know, that you're not an overnight success. So overnight success is really just actually, it's nice. It sounds great, but in actuality, it doesn't really happen because behind that overnight success are years of work and actually getting yourself to the point where, you know, you've reached a point of success. What makes Brown Publishing different from other independent publishers. And I would like to add that Publishers Weekly has, for the second year in a row, has named Brown Books Publishing as the fastest growing independent book publisher in the United States, or I don't know, worldwide. You can correct me on that one, but that is, uh, congratulations on that to both you and Miss Brown. Thank you. Yeah, we are currently the second fastest growing indie in the U.S. for the last two years running, which is frankly an exhausting accolade when I think about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that the gray hair? Is that why we have gray hair? Six people think of the gray hair as I mean, okay. I know people can't see the gray hair. Of the um, well, I just revealed I mean, it to everyone. <laughs> you, know, least, you know, as you know, I have a, a background, a long background in traditional publishing, and I, I come from New York, from that world. And when I met Millie five years ago, what is two things struck me as being absolutely brilliant in her founding principles for this organization. One is that it was all about the relationship. And in fact, she, she even trademarked the term the relationship publisher, which I thought was fantastic. And it, it really, it drew me in, in terms of, okay, that's interesting. And that's, that's different from what my ex- experience had been in New York in the nineties and then out in California after that. And then later on in, in, in global publishing. So I, I was looking forward to you know, an environment where the relationship to the author and making sure that there was an intimate knowledge of what the author was looking to convey and who they were, that was something we were going to carry forward for sure. And you know, the other thing that in, 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 in driving that relationship, it provides the author both with a comfort level and kind of a, a guide into the world, into this, this confusing world that we just described, right? I mean, you're putting a book out there and you're trying to figure out how am I gonna to connect to an audience? How, how am I going to get on the bookshelves? How are we going to, you know, what is, and it's our job just to, you know, work with an author hand in hand and walk them through the development and production and manufacturing process. But once everything's done, we extend that all the way into the marketing and sales process so that people know, you know, what their responsibilities are, what we can do for them, what might be available outside, how our sales reps work, you know, and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to get someone comfortable with that. But the result is that half of what we do are authors coming back for additional books or authors referring other people in to our organization for that reason, because they have developed a, just a sense of understanding for the publishing industry and trust with us. And we've, we've had authors be successful with us and then go on to a major publisher. And, and one such author I'm thinking of right now, his name is uh, Jim Whitten. He did a financial book with us, then went on to publish with McGraw Hill, and then he came back to us. And in his acknowledgments for that book, he said to Brown Books, "It's good to be home." And oh, that's that great. just nice. it really it hits us exactly where we want to be. We want to be in the hearts and minds of our authors, and we want to be with them on their journey. Yeah, no, I think that Millie Brown's trademarking that whole uh, relationship publisher 
is really part and parcel to, I think, the reason for your success. I think authors need that in many ways. And also, it is contrary to how conventional publishers actually deal with the writers. You know, most of the time, you're not talking to the chief operating officer or the CEO. You're pretty far down the uh, totem pole on that. So it does establish a sense of comfort. And I, I think it's great. Now, let me ask you for those who are listening in who have a book in them or, you know, that's the bucket list. I don't think you could see anyone's bucket list and not see, I want to publish the great American novel. Right. Okay. So do you accept agented or unagented submissions? What are the rules for Brown books? Yes and yes. You accept really yes and yes. Okay, well that summed it up. Okay, I have another question. <laughs> no, no, but I mean I can I can speak to that a little more. And I, I want to go back and revisit the comment you made about um the relation the nature of the relationship with publishers in New York as well. You know, I've got a, a good friend uh who's a former publisher at, at a at one of the big five. And you know, he's he's older, he's semi-retired, he talks like this, you know, and he, and he and I get on the phone once in a while just to talk about what's happening in the industry and and as I was explaining the model and the process and our relationship-driven approach here at Brown Books over, you know, say my first year of tenure, he he stopped one day and he said, "You talk to authors, don't you?" <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah, I talk to authors all day. That's my job. He said, "Yeah, in New York, you get promoted, so you don't have to." Huh. Wow. And wow. that was now. I will say, to be fair. That recently, we were, uh, we were talking with a, uh, an author who's published actually by the same house that he is out of, and he said that things have been changing. They've, they've been creating more visibility to what's happening on the book sales side for authors, and I heard some good things out of what's happening in um, the editorial group of another major publisher where I used to work, where there's been higher contact levels with author and with authors, and what I'd like to say is that if our company and, and companies, there are really are no other companies like us exactly, but if our companies and companies that aspire to be what, what we're doing have driven that part of the conversation and have begun to affect some of the practices happening, then we welcome that because in my view, every author, no matter where they are or who's publishing them, should have a relationship with the publisher. I think that's absolutely wonderful. You know, it's so funny. I've got to say, when you said that you talk to authors, it's almost like, yeah, I speak to ghosts too. <laughs> I mean, it was that same right. kind of, I'm, I'm, oh my God, I'm, you talk I'm to book, authors. <laughs> I'm a book whisperer. You know, You're you know. a book whisperer, absolutely. <laughs> you know, in terms of where we, we take submissions, we do take non-solicited submissions. Uh, we take them over the website. People call in, they call up and have, say, I have an idea. And that's the first thing that really does set us apart from many, many publishers. Oh, that's huge. Publishers in our model is that we will talk with them. We will get on the phone first and, and we'll, we'll see if number one qualified content, you know, if they're saying I have a nonfiction book about, it could be climate change, you know, that, you know, the first questions are going to be, well, are you a climate Scientologist? You know, are you a scientist? Are you someone who has, do you have the credentials to present this book? I mean, we're going to be as discriminatory about the people presenting information as any other publisher would be and should be. And that should always be the case to make sure that, you know, what people are approaching with us with have merit from their authority to speak on the subject and have merit from the potential for a market. So from that edge, we're really not different at all. In terms of agents, I really, you know, for a long time, agents really have not approached us. And over the last year, we've started to have conversations with them and I would invite that conversation. I would really like to speak with more agents because in what we've done, which is essentially taken the model that's been existing for decades in publishing in the United States, and we've flipped it in terms of value, risk, reward. I mean, that's what we do. We, you know, our authors, they own their books, they assume their risk, they get the reward level that the publishers get usually, right? So we literally just change it from what is essentially the shorthand is, is we change it from 90-10 to 10-90. 90% author, 10% us, as opposed to 10% author, 90% us. And that's, that's, um, that's our promise. And, and that's what we seek to, to achieve for the author and with the author. But I would invite a conversation with agents that say, there is no reason why you can't flip that model as well. Why you can't work with us and bring us people. And we can literally take what is your normal agreement on the agency side and just flip it around and make it still work. Because you know, authors who are able to, to work with us, you know, who have the financial means and resources to do that, they, they really enjoy, you know, what and how we do things. And I don't see why, uh, why an agent, 
and since you know the on the back end, the authors are are they're receiving the vast majority of distribution revenue. There is no reason why you can't fund that properly for an agent the way they would expect. And there's so I'm looking forward to actually pushing the model even further than it has been recently, and to expanding you know our work with with agencies as well as continuing to take unsolicited manuscripts and and referrals that we get now. It's one thing to say unsolicited referrals, but one of the things Scott Husing says a lot is the book proposal is harder to write than the book itself. You know, your business plan for your operation coming in. Can you expand on that process? Because it's one thing to send a segment of your unwritten book, but it's another thing to send a whole business plan. Yeah, it's and, and so to be clear, we expect and we accept full manuscripts. Okay. And the reason we do that is we're very old school in this. We read everything we get. Wow. We read it. And that is before we've had a conversation. That's before. And the reason we do that is because there's no other way truly to judge the quality of the writing and the authorship, especially in an unsolicited, you know, never before published author. We have to see what book craft is like and we have to understand where they're at. We have professional readers who just read for us. We have some of the folks, it, it, it's everything from, you know, entry level through people who have a master's in literary critique to specialists in their genres who, who work with us from across the country, who will take a look at manuscripts with us as we consider or send a, a book into our editorial board for review, you know, for potential publication. So we're not big on taking just a book proposal or the two sentence, because in my view, writing a proposal for an agent or writing a proposal, you know, that would then go on to a publisher is akin to, to your first question, Pete, you have to be essentially a marketing expert to know how to craft that properly. Right. Right. Down to one pages. And you could be a very good writer and not a marketing expert. And because of that, and if you're not working with an agent, your pitch is either not, it's going to miss the mark or, I mean, I know an author who's a friend of mine, he's, he's written six books and he just, told me recently, he's like, he's getting ready to, to self-publish another one right now. And he just told me recently that, that he's like, I, I just, I'm not good at writing marketing copy. And this guy has a background in marketing. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. There's a blank spot in my own book and I can't. So there's, you know, all over the map when it comes to segments. And if you give us a portion or 90 pages of a, of a book, you know, we're not going to know, is, does it off properly? Because often, especially early in their careers, authors will tire as they continue to write. Or yeah. they won't stand properly how to resolve plot points, especially if they're writing fiction. Or, you know, they'll they'll just start to ramble at a certain point and, and things won't tie up well at the end. Or so it could be great for the first hundred pages. And then after that, it just starts to fall apart. Right. And so let me ask you this. I think one of the things that you're stressing here, and I think a point that I would go away from this, is that writing a book proposal, like a synopsis and a cover letter to a publisher, if you don't have the skills or you, do, you might be a wonderful writer and have published six books, and it, but if this is not your strong suit, the fact that you actually read an entire manuscript that is submitted to you is great because you may lose an opportunity because you can't communicate in a book proposal as you would in the book that you've written. So for wow. authors submitting, I mean, I think that's actually pretty telling. Can I ask you, Tom, what was a book that surprised you for its success or lack of published? Um, a number, every, there's, it's actually got into a place where when I talk with my sales force and we start to see early demand hitting the list that's coming prior to publication, um, we start using the phrase, you know, this might be the surprise hit for this season. So every, wow. every season or at least twice a year, there, there is a book that just hits a nerve that we did not understand was going to, to happen. And when it does, it can fly. One, one that, that comes to mind, there are several. We did a, a book of historic fiction called Wounded Tiger for the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor a few years ago. And the author came to us late with the book. It was nearly completely prepared and was essentially just ready to go, which is a very rare thing for an author to come in with a well-crafted book, like almost completely ready cover design, you know, just set. And we took a look at it and said, this is a good book, but we only had about two months, which is no time to prepare market and marketing, no time to do, you know, advanced, you know, when, when we sit down with the genre buyers at a national retailer at a, at a Barnes and Noble or a books a million, we need to give six, seven months advance notice to those buyers because they're planning their budgets a couple of quarters out. 
So when we come with a book 60 days in advance, they're like, that's nice. What else you got? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> sort of like, yeah. and next. And that book, and it was, it was big too. It's like, you know, several hundred pages. It was um, not the lowest price point. I mean, there was just a lot about it that seemed challenging. And I, I the author of Prime said, I'm just a little concerned about, you know, when we bring this book to market. Well, long story short, we could not keep that book in stock. Organizations were ordering it a thousand at a time. And by the time the shipment got there, they were just pre-sold. Done. Wow. Essentially sustained a nationwide out of stock status for the first two months of its life. Oh. And it's a fascinating story. It's the story of Masoda Fushida, who's the Japanese naval air captain who led the attack on Pearl Harbor and his eventual conversion to Christianity, his move to LA, and the fact that he became a preacher there for the rest of his life. I can imagine that a lot, probably also a lot of educational institutions were probably, did, did you get inquiries for them bringing in something? It sounds like this was a, definitely a seminal historical kind of a, of a book. It is, and it, and it, it, it marked, uh, I think we hit a couple of things with it, and the author was very, very clever. It's historic fiction, but it's not historic fiction the way you might think of it. I consider it, it's almost a subgenre, it's hyper accurate historic fiction. So every event, every meeting, everything that's described in the book, he documented that it actually happened. And he had photographs from most of it. And the only thing he made up was dialogue because he had to, because he wasn't in the room in the late 30s and early 40s. Mm -hmm. So doing that, we've now published a couple of books that are in that vein. And what we're finding is that younger audiences who grew up being entertained with reading, you know, young adults or children's books, they, they now are adults and they are looking, they have a more sophisticated palette for their reading preferences. They are looking for nonfiction material, but they still want to be entertained. So by bringing sort of a, almost a, a novel, novel construction approach to historic fiction, people are bringing history to life. And we've got another book that's very similar, Forefathers and Founding Fathers, which is in search of its audience right now. It has hit some, and I'm looking for it to catch on more. But we, we have a, the author there, Michael Gordon, he sent in a DNA test to you know, uh, one of those companies um, that tracks your background and found out that he's the 11th generation descendant of the founders of Rhode Island. Wow. And he decided to write a historic fiction piece on his family. It literally is history coming to life. And the fact that the issues that the Puritans were facing and that the founders of the state of Rhode Island were facing were many of the same issues today. What is the nature of the freedom of speech and freedom of religion in America? What is the relationship between genders in America? You know, how does power work, you know, within that structure? And, and these people who were setting down, they were setting down these principles over, you know, 350 years ago ended up affecting uh, the founding of the nation and the constitution in very, very profound ways. Um, and these are debates that are still alive today. So in terms of, you know, bringing history to life, I mean, that's, if I had a book that, that I wanted to put in every middle schooler's hands in the country, if not at least New England, that would be the one. So that sounds amazing. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Now, as a publisher, if I might add, Pete, I was going to ask him this because I'm kind of curious because, you know, I love the written word. <laughs> and I'm sure you as a publisher love the written word. What are your favorite authors, Tom? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And I'm sure you, as a publisher, love the written work. What are your favorite authors, Tom? Oh, you know, I grew up very fortunate to spend time every summer in New England out of reach, you know, prior to the creation of cable television and out of reach of the air. So you're so, 100? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm 100. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and, you know, because you can only get, you know, one or two hours of TV a week if the, if the wind was right. Oh my online. gosh. <laughs> it's actually true. You know, I spent a lot of time in the local bookstore and the local library. And of course, like many young boys, early 80s or, you know, late 70s, and early 80s, I was, you know, reading J.R. or Tolkien while watching, you know, my feet pace as I paced the room under my, under the book. And, but I also, I, I found some really interesting alignment with motivational writing that surprised me. So Richard Bach was one of my really um, 
early uh, inspirations uh, as an author. And, and I read Jonathan Livingston Siegel and, you know, one, The Adventures of the Inside Mechanic. And I ended up reading all of this stuff before I was 12. Wow, um, that's great. It was very, very, it, I, I just could not wait for more. And, and it was just a, and we had a really beautiful moment because he contacted us a few years ago uh, because he was, he had picked up one of our children's books Sashi the Scared Little Sheltie and, and was a fan of it. So he wrote to the author and just said, I really liked your books and I'm also a published author. And and of course, you know, Richard Fox, he's huge. He sold over yeah. 60 million books in the last, you know, 40 years. And and my author responded with, really? What have you written? And I was like, oh. Oh, <laughs> you know? whoa. Yeah. It was great. So I and I just said, Mr. Bach, I wanted to thank you for, you know, providing this full circle moment in my career. You were definitely one of the reasons why I went into publishing, and and I read everything that you had written really as a as a young boy, and I just can't tell. I thank you enough for that. Must um, have been an incredible and, moment for you. I had a really nice you know, for email for a couple of days regarding our publishing choices and what was happening, and um, he ended up he, he he wrote another book. He's in his early eighties now, and and um, he decided he was going to write one more. So I can't wait to get a hold of him. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. You know, if you hang around the business long enough, because as you know, I'm over 100 years old. You're over 100 years old. Well, Pete, I have to say something. Excuse me for cutting cutting in, but I have to say, I have talked to Tom just a few times. I mean, really briefly, actually. Right, Tom? It was real brief. But (laughs) but he uh, he has some anecdotes that will actually have you rolling on the floor laughing about the publishing world. <laughs> I know that you can probably share one of your gems there, Tom, with all the potential writers that are going to be calling you. Publishing just creates an avenue for surreality that doesn't exist elsewhere. It really, it's fascinating. The shorthand I have for this is that early in my career, I was at HarperCollins and we got a note that went company-wide for us to ensure that our, you know, our dress and appearance were going to be, you know, on point for the next day and that our, our, our workspace was clear. And because uh, Rupert Murdoch, who owned HarperCollins at the time, you know, through News Corp, was going to be in the building, as was Newt Gingrich and Howard Stern. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and we're just, just in my mind, the thought process of, how are the logistics of those meetings going to go, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, and Howard Stern was in to sign a contract for his book, and Newt Gingrich was actually coming back to return. There was a big hullabaloo when he was Speaker of the House because he had uh, received a, a large advance for a book by Harper Collins, and it became you know a talking point in the media. So he ended up returning it and getting a dollar out of Rupert Murdoch's wallet for it in return. Standing stuff. It was um, or or. So the, you know, the story went. So there are, there are just, and so just imagine that's really my career. And as you proceed, you know, publishing just creates, this isn't really a funny part of my career, but it creates the opportunity to encounter wisdom and genius in its most diverse forms. And, and oh, I was working well in magazine. Yeah, I was working in magazine in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and I was working for a, a publisher that published um, trade magazines and, and I was supporting a building that had two groups in it. One was the high tech group. So, you know, like C, C++ users journal, Microsoft systems journal, like that kind of stuff. And, and then the music group on the other side of the building, which was, you know, guitar player magazine and bass player magazine and keyboard musician. And, and so one day I walk into the elevator and the head, the lead editor for the high tech group is there and he's standing there with Linus Trevaltz, who's the creator of Linux. Wow. Wow. And he to meet him briefly and just said, wow, it's so nice to meet you. And oh, you're in for an interview. That's very interesting. And, you know, and, and just went about my Wednesday, you know, and the next day was Thursday. And, and I walk on the elevator and, and Ed, who, who led the music group is standing there with John Lee Hooker. Wow. I'm like, oh, it's very nice to meet you. oh, you're in for an interview. It's, it's very cool. To oh, Thank wow. you for being here. And that's, you know, when you, when you have one day, you're talking with a YA fantasy author, the next day, you know, Alan West is meeting at your office to pre-sign books for you, um, who, you know, people know, might may not publish Texas Hold the Nation with us here, and he's, he's currently running for chair of the GOP in the state of Texas. Um, that is, those are very diverse viewpoints, but both very passionate viewpoints and both uh, very extremely intelligent and, um, you know, they, they carry their own genius and their own wisdom with them. 
at all points. And, and that is the thing that has kept me hooked on publishing um, and really in, in media in general, where you, you have an opportunity to spend time with people in any, in any function. How hard is it for the publisher to separate politics from profit? I mean, Newt Gingrich walks in and, and Nancy Pelosi walk in. How, do, how does a publisher deal with that? Oh, I definitely publish them both, without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> like, without a doubt. I mean, so, so, and I have a lot of passion around this point. Um, my politics aside, because they're irrelevant, right? My job as a publisher is to qualify the material, to make sure it's high quality, to make sure that it has a market, to make sure that it won't harm anyone, right? Those are, those are the key pieces. And, and I have been involved in, in decisions where we've affirmed those, all of those points. And after, once that's done, then my job is to take an author and connect them to their audience. It's not my job to censor. And when publishers, it's something that actually, it really disturbs me and frankly makes me sick is when a publisher says, well, we're, we're only a conservative publisher. We're only a liberal publisher. I understand if you're only a genre publisher. I know, I know companies that are just mystery publishers and they're very good at that. And because they're specialized on that in an editorial way, um, we are a general interest publisher, which means we will look at really any kind of title and we will, we will consider it for its merits within its audience. And that's, that's important. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, publishing is the moment I really fell in love with publishing. I was working in New York. I was young. I was in on a Saturday and I was helping write this system that was going to transform content, right? I was doing the, the sort of the boring technical stuff early in my career. And I started thinking about, well, what, what is publishing really? Because it was a question that had been posed to me uh, by an executive at, at another major publisher. And, and I didn't really have a good answer. So I, the first thing I thought about was, well, Constitution guarantees um, speech. So I went in, in the office while I was sitting there and I found a copy of the Constitution and I started reading. And I started with, uh, you know, First Amendment, you know, right to free speech, you know, you, you know, no, you should be basically, you, should, you cannot be compelled to speak. You cannot be you know, prevented from speaking. Okay, that's fine. That's well and good. But it doesn't say anything about the business. Right. That just says you can stand on a milk crate on the corner and say whatever I want. Okay, great. So then I started reading. From, so I went back to the beginning and started reading preamble, went all the way through. And it was when I got to powers of Congress that I found this little clause that I then have since researched and learned that Franklin himself had lobbied for. Wow. And it was a clause in the powers of Congress that establishes Congress's responsibility for guaranteeing to authors and inventors a fair compensation against their against their investment for a limited time period in order to promote um, essentially the arts and sciences. And when I read that, there was just this clarity of unbelievable genius that came through in it. And it, it brought me to it, like tears welled up in my eyes. I became very emotional about it because it, it made me understand a couple of things. Number one, Franklin, you know, he didn't predict Google, but he predicted a world where something like that might exist. Because what he was saying was, based on how much money you're investing, that is what should determine what your potential return is for intellectual property. So, and that that right should be guaranteed for a temporary amount of time, for an amount of time. And in doing that, he's recognizing two things. In a free society, all speech belongs to everyone, right? In other words, the idea is we should all be able to speak and it should belong to all of us. Yeah. So ideas are free. But if you put investment into promoting an idea and getting into the hands of people, and if that it creates an embitterment for society as a whole, then you should receive some limited reward for it for a given period of time. And that's why everything that we do, both publishing and in music and film, it's, it's structured the way it is relative to copyright and in, in industry, in patent and invention. It, it is a, a, a cornerstone of how we operate. It explains why we appreciate IP in this country in, in, in ways that other countries don't, because it's literally woven into the fabric of our constitution. That is such a great, I mean, bravo. <laughs> yeah. I'm clapping over no, here. That so was brilliant. You know, something that I really, you know, every time I meet someone who's young and entering the business or, you know, we, you know, we have an intern or whoever, it's, it's a point that I always want to get across. And I think it's um, an important one and you're passionate about it. And I think they need to hear 
passion in this day and age, especially, um, and I don't want to get into the generation, but I think we're in a generation that doesn't read as much as the, uh, the generations before. And that's, uh, that's a sad thing because I think you need to dip your pen into a well of write, you know, to be able to write well, to be able to be a fully rounded, knowledgeable person. And I know I encourage my son to read and uh, well, I have yeah. a battle yeah. halo to get I'm him actually, to do it. Yeah. I'm actually going to cross you on that. Um, publishing as a whole um, is relatively flat in terms of its its overall size, revenue, and attention that it receives from audiences. And younger audiences are contributing to some of the fastest growth areas. Really? Yes. Wow, that's that's great news. Yeah, and the way to hear the way to see that in action is very simple. It, Millie, Millie asked me about it once. We were in an airport, and she's like, "Tell me about this this." young adult stuff, this YA stuff. And I said, come here. And there was a Hudson News right in front of us. So we walked in front of the Hudson News and I said, what do you see? She's like, political books, business books. Right. That was the front shelf facing out. Right. She said, now come with me. We walked behind that shelf. On the back side of that shelf, all YA titles. On the front side of the following shelf, all YA titles. On the back side of the next shelf, all YA titles. It was like three or four to one. And the reason is there's a huge audience. um, And you have a son, Gabby, so I understand where you're coming from because uh, women and girls purchase eighty percent of the books in the country, just so you know, and that's because um, you know they're smarter than we are. We're right? brilliant, yes. <laughs> that's the line. Um, and uh, that's 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 just me, you know. Um, I have a background in education, publishing, so I, I understand that language abilities, you know, develop earlier, and girls they carry them for, forward further. Um, the distinction in, in standardized testing, and all the way down the line, you can tell that you know that's 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 a known fact. Um, and, and it's reflected in, in the sales patterns, and which is why buyers are always saying, what do you have for boys? Because they're looking for us to develop more that might generate you know, additional interest and traffic in what is essentially a, um, just a, a lower tier market. You know? but, um, but, but saying but, that as a young adult being a, such a booming business you know, in the publishing world, does, the, is it, does it tend to be a certain genre of fantasy or, you know, and does the heroine or hero is it a female you know what is the voice there um you know that doesn't you know that draws a certain audience the a a gender bit, audience yeah i mean if you look at uh, i mean so, some famous books lately do have a uh, stronger female roles i mean generally it's reflecting what's going on what's happening and this is my theory um because i i do have a, a, approximately a, a third of my careers in educational publishing um Students have been migrating because schools and, and administrations and states have been migrating to all digital um, school infrastructure for the past several years. And in fact, my own one of my daughters, she's, a, she's going into her sophomore year of college now, but for her last two years of high school, she was completely digital. No paper turned in whatsoever. It was wow. all digital. And, and that's becoming more and more common. And as that occurs, um, kids are experiencing screen fatigue. So between school, high school, and homework, you've got 10, 11, 12 hours a day on screen. And at the end of it, you're just tired and you want something, you want to unplug with something else. So they're turning to print. And that's been happening, you know, more and more lately. Um, so there's, there's, that's the one major trend component. The other is that there's a different piece. My, my, now my older daughter also plays video games. She plays Fortnite. She does, you know, she does all that stuff. And, and she's, and so when I asked them, I asked both of my daughters, I said, what do you guys think about? print. And, and my older daughter said, you know, it's interesting when I play video games, when I get to level 53, my goal is oh. to get to level four. I, there's no end. When I read a book, there's a beginning, a middle an end. I get to the back cover. I close the back cover. I take that book. I put it on my shelf and it's a badge. I read it. Yeah. It's yeah. done. It's completed. It's something that has, you know, a, a, uh, its own value. And my younger daughter was great. She was 13 at the time. And she said, dad, you know, you know, tablets are for like, you know, interactive stuff. I mean, innately, kids understand that if you're using a piece of technology, the technology should behave like itself. It shouldn't, you shouldn't try to make it behave like a book, bottom line. And you will have e-readers out there. And, and that is about 15% of the market. And it's an important part of the market. But the, the, the e-book doesn't replace the book. It creates a portable bookshelf. That's really right. what it does. So right. for the people, it's convenient uh, because you're not carrying a massive, you know, 800 book onto the plane yeah. or something. So I go on the road with my Kindle. I bring eight books with me on my Kindle and maybe right. 
Yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing like the feel of a book in your hands and uh, books to me are like old friends, my favorites. So one of the things uh, I wanted to do, so I'm going to throw you off a little bit. Do you have a book in you? I do. I, yeah. And I'll go, I'll go on, on further. I've been telling people publicly about this and and now I'm just going to make it happen more. On the break it down show. Uh Good. We got an exclusive. (laughs) Uh, I started at a, at a writer's conference earlier this year. I started work. I was, I was inspired by a couple of the attendees and, and, and friends of mine um, who said, you need to be writing. You need to be writing now. You know? And wow. um, I started, I went back to my hotel room that night and put down the introduction to a book on the nature of publishing and the nature of words and content in, in America. Um, it's uh, it's called the currency of content, and it's about you know how it is that you know we take words, order them, place value on them, and and get them out to people, um, re- regardless of what form that takes. In fact, the in- the, fo- the introduction was all about uh, an experience that I had while working in in high tech in Silicon Valley, and and getting online content to go out and some of the trials and tribulations we were having with that. So um, it really addresses what in my mind is publishing in all of its forms. Um, in my mind, film is publishing. In my mind, podcasts are publishing. In my mind, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not about putting a couple hundred pieces of paper in between two covers and putting it up. When the one interesting question that came up when we started the boring technology conversation 30 years ago uh, wasn't, you know, how are we going to be buying books in the future? It's how are we going to be defining content and its value in the future? And that's the question I've really spent most of my career thinking about. And uh, I'm at a place where I think it, it might be helpful to some people if I shared what I've learned. Well, congratulations. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant idea. Now, are there any books that you would recommend to writers wanting to get into or, you know, take it from the bucket list to, okay, these are really great. I know for myself, I love Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces. I read that way too young, and so did my son, thanks to his mother. Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont was always a great one. But any anyone that you are looking at or is on your bookshelf? I mean, you know, there are, if you're looking in terms of how to craft, um, you can start with, there, there are excellent books on writing that were published by, one by Ray Bradbury, one by Stephen King, um, one by I also really do enjoy the hero cycle, um, and especially uh, the adaptations of of Joseph Campbell's work in those interviews that he did with Bill Moyers. Which oh, that was are, excellent! One of my favorite ever. And they're on Netflix now. That whole series. I, I know it's brilliant. Anyone listening, if you want to write, you should go and listen to that series. Let me also add in another great book for writers, especially screenwriters, people focused on fiction. Jeff Calhoun's book, The Guide for Every Screenwriter is legit it is legend and you guys have got to get it if you're into the story writing game because he'll help you break down all of the beats that you have to have at your fingertips yeah that's a great book those pieces are you know that that gets you started it it gets the conversation going but there will be points when you're reading that stuff that you're just like i don't get it i don't understand and that's where you're going to need some kind of of outside support or additional it might be local it could be you know a Check it out first, you know, really do your homework and, and, you know, make some calls regarding, you know, a writer's group that might be local to you or a writer's guild. I mean, I've, I've done some, some work if you're in the, in the, uh, in the Northwest with the, the Idaho Writers Guild. It's one of the strongest writing communities centered out of Boston I've ever huh. seen. And they're amazing. There's a great one in Dallas. There's a great one in Seattle. There's a great one in Denver. There's a great one. There are, there are just terrific organizations that go out and support if you're into romance, of course, Romance Writers of America. So those are all good support as you, you know, are honing some craft. But after that, be open to, especially if, if you know, when you get into the submission process, um, a lot of what we do, if, if we find that the author is willing and they're able and they're especially open to coaching, what we normally do is we take someone who might be good, but they're not quite ready. You know, they're, they're just, they're still developing and we can tell and that's when that's when I say, well, we can fix almost any book, you know, and, and we usually will pair them with an individual for months when it's essentially welcome to creating creative writing level 400. This will be your personal instructor for the next three or four months. 
and they, you know, they teach writing at the university level, or they've published ten books on their own, or they've got. And we've got, you know, editors seek, you know, an editor, if be it through us or not. But um, if you're going through that process, it's it's nothing like having someone on the other end who can help you, um, you know, not so much shape your voice because you're going to be coming with that, but about the, you know. Uh, a plotting and or you know show versus tell or you know things that are just basic construction principles about how narrative is written and how it's ingested that you need to you need to understand in order to have any kind of a successful approach in your publishing. Uh, I think this has been extraordinarily informative. I think anyone uh, on the Break It Down Show fan club here who's been listening, I think they've they've taken enormous information from hearing Tom talk about the publishing world. It's very rare that having been a part of writers groups in the past, so I've been to conferences and I've heard publishers talk. Uh, I think Tom is really extraordinary in how much he shares about his own passion passion for writing and the written word. And I definitely think that Brown Publishing has, uh, with the way they have a relationship with the writers is, uh, is wonderful and long time in coming, probably, I would say. So it's been great. It's been real, Thomas. Real. <laughs> so thanks for coming on and thanks for having me once again, join your fun, fun podcast. I love it. Of course. It is always great. Yeah. And Tom, really seriously, thank you very much. And anytime you want to feature an author, we'd love to have you guys come back. Let's talk to that author because as you said, the podcast world is part of the whole content world and we're writing a book of our own in this way, in this medium. So I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us. Oh, thank you, Pete and Gabby. I really appreciate the time today. It's been a great conversation. And where can we find you? You can find us at brownbooks.com. Great. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again. 